This is the start of a series of videos we, where we look at factorization in arbitrary integral domains. So we already know something about factorization in the integers. We know, for instance, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says that any integer can be factored into um, a product of prime numbers in some sort of unique way. And we also know about factorizations in polynomial rings over a field. We know that there's a notion of a greatest common divisor. We know that there's a Euclidean algorithm and so on and so forth. And so so in fact, some of those things go over to arbitrary integral domains and others don't. And some of those things go on to special types of integral domains. And that's what we want to look at. So we need a bunch of definitions um, first before we get started. And then we'll look at some simple examples. So in this setup, we'll have R is a commutative ring with one. So any kind of commutative ring with one. And then D is an integral domain. Recall that an integral domain is a commutative ring with one where there are no zero divisors. Okay, so the first thing that we want to define is the notion of divisibility inside an arbitrary ring. So we say that A and B um, in R, uh, we say that A divides B, and we'll just write A divides B like this, if there exists a C and R with B equals A times C. So that's the same definition that we had in numbers, it's just in an arbitrary ring now. Next, we say that A and B are associates if there exists a unit such that A equals a unit times B. So what this means is that they're not the same, well they're potentially not the same, but they're very very close to being the same. They differ by a unit. So 4 and negative 4 are associates because they differ by negative 1 and negative 1 is a unit, it has a multiplicative inverse, namely itself is its multiplicative inverse. The next thing we want to do is build up the notion of primeness and a non-unit P is said to be irreducible if whenever P equals AB that tells you that A or B is a unit. So like the number negative 5 is irreducible inside the integers because if you factor negative 5, the only way to do it would be like negative 1 times 5, but negative 1 is a unit. Um, okay, great. And then next, we say that P is prime if when P divides AB, then that means that P either divides A or P divides B. So that's something that you prove about prime numbers in uh, the integers, but that's something that we're taking as the definition for primeness within an integral domain. Okay, so let's look at an example. We're actually going to look at a couple examples in this video, but the first one is um, related to polynomials, and then the second one will be related to uh, something else. Okay, so let's consider uh, this following subring, um, R, which is generated by x squared, comma, y squared, comma, xy, and it is a subring of the ring of polynomials in two variables with entries in the rational numbers. So what I mean here is that this everything inside R looks like a polynomial in x squared, y squared, and xy. Okay, great. And then I just want to notice something here, um, and this is not something that we'll prove, but this is like something that's maybe a little bit beautiful, and that uh, here R is actually called the polynomial ring of invariance um, of QXY under the group action Z2, where Z2 takes X to negative X and Y to negative Y. So it is the ring of polynomial invariance for what it's worth. Okay, great. So uh, now the next thing that I want to notice is that x squared, y squared, and xy in R are irreducible. So they're not irreducible inside of the bigger ring Q of XY, but they are irreducible within R. And that's because, well, you can't write X squared as something times something unless one of them is a unit. So that's pretty easy to see. But XY is not prime. And let's see why xy is not prime. Notice that xy divides x squared times y squared. Well, it's just xy times xy. Um, but xy does not divide x squared and xy does not divide y squared. 
So we've got it divides the product, but it does not divide either of them. So this gives us a nice example of something that's irreducible, but is not prime. Okay, good. So I'll go ahead and erase the board and then we'll look at, we'll build up another example that is irreducible but is not prime. So next, we'll build up an example of something that's irreducible but not prime in this ring Z adjoin I root three. In other words, this is all terms that are of the form A plus B I root three where A and B are in the integers. So this is a subring of the complex numbers and you can check that it's a subring pretty easily using the subring test. And we'll do that by using this function called a norm function. And so this goes from our ring z adjoin i root 3 to the natural numbers. And what it does is it essentially takes uh, this complex number and multiplies it by its conjugate. So that gives us um, the norm applied to a plus b i root 3 is a squared plus 3b squared. Okay, then we have these four properties which we'll prove. So the first is that n of x equals zero if and only if x equals zero. The second is that we have this multiplicative property. So n x y equals n x times n y. The third says that u is a unit if and only if n u equals one. And the fourth says that n x is prime. Um, if n x is prime, then x is irreducible. Okay, so another thing that I want to point out is that this is not only something that would be useful in this ring z adjoin i root 3. This is actually interesting in any z adjoin the square root of something called a square free number. So I'll let you guys look at that and that's often like left to be a nice exercise is to generalize this example that we're going to do. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through the proof of this one at a time. So let's look at this first part. So I'm not going to do both directions. Obviously the reverse direction is quite trivial because a squared plus 3 b squared. If a and b are both zero, then obviously you get zero there. Okay, so what I'll assume is, uh, so I'll go this forward direction. So in other words, let's set x equal to a plus uh, b i root 3 and assume nx equals zero. But what that tells us is that a squared plus 3b squared equals zero. Great. But also note that a squared is bigger than or equal to zero and b squared is also bigger than or equal to zero. And that's because you're squaring integers here. But the only way to add non-negative numbers together to get something in that zero is for both of them to be zero. So that means they're both equal to zero, but that means that a and b are both zero, but that tells us that x equals zero. Great. So that's all there is to do. And like I said, the reverse direction is pretty straightforward. So let's look at the next part. So the second part. So let's say that x is a plus um, b i root 3. And let's say that y is equal to c plus, plus d i root 3. Okay, great. And now uh, let's notice that that makes um, x times y equal to a... Um, C minus uh, minus three B D. So that's what we get from the real parts using the fact that I times I is negative one. And then for the other part, we'll get, let's see, that's going to be A D plus B C times I root three. Okay, so that's what we get there. And now it's just like a quick check that if we do n x y, notice that's going to give us um, a c minus three b d squared plus three times a d plus b c quantity squared. But I'll leave it to you guys to like multiply all that out and factor appropriately. It's not too bad, it's just kind of lengthy. But what you will end up with is a squared plus 3b squared times c squared plus 3d squared, which is exactly equal to nx times ny. So in fact, I've only left out a couple of steps. It's probably not that hard to uh, bridge the gap there. Okay, good. So I'll erase the board and I'll look at part three and part four.
So let's go ahead and look at part three. So let's do this forward direction. So in other words, we want to suppose that u is a unit, but what that means is that uh, there exists a u inverse inside of z adjoint i uh, root three, where u inverse times u is equal to one, so with u times u inverse equals one. Now let's go ahead and use part two to apply n to this. So notice we get n of u times u inverse is the same thing as n applied to one, which is one. But on the other hand, this is n u times n u inverse. But then, next thing we want to do is recall that each of these are natural numbers. Recall that this norm function goes from our ring to the natural numbers. So we have the product of two natural numbers equals one, but there's only one way to do that. There's only way to take a product of natural numbers and for them to be one, and that's if they all equal one. So that means that n u has to be equal to one. So now uh, let's go ahead and look at the reverse direction. So in other words, we want to suppose that n u equals one and then show that it is a unit. Okay, so uh, let's see how to do that. So let's suppose that u equals a plus b i root three and n u, which equals a squared plus three b squared equals uh, one. So now notice the next thing we can see here is that uh, b squared is always bigger than or equal to zero because it's the square of a integer. But if it's bigger than zero, then this thing immediately is bigger than one. So we already know here that b has to be equal to zero. Great. But what that tells us is that a squared equals one, but if a squared equals one, that means a equals plus or minus one, but that means u was plus or minus one from the beginning, but those are both units. So in fact, the situation here is less interesting than it could be if we had a different number in here, because if we had a different number there in there, we would potentially have more units than just plus or minus one. But this is the situation in this case. Okay, I'll clean up the board and we'll look at number four. Okay, now we're ready to look at number four. In other words, if nx is prime, then x is irreducible. Okay, so let's go ahead and suppose um, that x is reducible. So let's suppose we, we can factor x into y times z. So in order to have x is irreducible, what we want is that either y or z is a unit. Okay, now the next thing that we want to do is apply the norm function. So we have nx equals ny times nz. Great. But we know that nx is a prime, but this is a prime in the natural numbers. So this is a prime in the natural numbers. So the only way to factor a prime in the natural numbers is for one of these to be one and the other one to be equal to the prime. So let's say here that ny is, is equal to one um, and nz is equal to nx, the prime that we had originally. Okay, good. And now, obviously, that could be flip-flopped, so we're actually choosing this kind of without loss of generality. So we now we have ny equals 1, but what that tells us is that y is a unit by this part right here. So that means we started with a factorization and we showed that one of the parts had to be a unit, but that's exactly what it takes for x to be irreducible by our definition over here. So we translate this notion of primeness over in the natural numbers to irreducibility over here in this um, integral domain z adjoin i root 3. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is use this result in order to give an example of something that is irreducible but not a prime. Okay, so now we want to show that this element right here, 1 plus i root 3, is irreducible but not a prime. And I should say this is all happening in our ring, z adjoin i root 3. Good. So let's go ahead and check that it's irreducible. So let's suppose that we can factor it. 
into x times y, and what we want to do is show that one of those things is a unit. So notice we'll have nx times ny is going to be equal to nxy, but nxy is 1 plus i root 3, but the norm of 1 plus i root 3 is obviously equal to 4. Great. So we've got something like that. And now the next thing that we want to do is look at two cases. So uh, case number one is x or y is a unit, but in that case we're done because if we factored it with a unit, then we already know it's irreducible. So case number two is that um, um, x and y are not units. So since they're not units, their norm is not equal to 1. But if their norm is not equal to 1, but they, their product of their norms is equal to 4, that tells us that the norm of x equals the norm of y, which is equal to 2. That's the only way to multiply to get 4 without using the number 1, obviously. Great, so we have nx plus, sorry, equals ny equals 2, but now let's just check that that's impossible. So let's say x is equal to a plus i, uh, sorry, b i root 3, but we have um, nx is going to be a squared plus 3b squared, but that's equal to 2. But that immediately tells us that b is equal to 0, because otherwise we'd be immediately bigger than 2. But then that tells us that a squared is equal to 2. But that's impossible because uh, the square root of 2 is obviously not an integer. And remember, a is an integer. Okay, so what that tells us that is that it is irreducible. Okay, so let's reiterate. We factored it. And then we said, if the only way to factor it is where one of them is a unit, we're done. So we assume that they're both not units. If they're both not units, then we got that the square root of 2 is an integer, which that's a uh, contradiction. Okay, so now let's go ahead and show that this thing is not prime with a little bit of a trick. So notice we can write 1 plus um, i root 3 times 1 minus i root 3. So that's the same thing as 4. And so you can check that. That's easy to see. But that's the same thing as 2 times 2. But now what this shows us is that, uh, so this equation shows us that 1 plus i root 3 divides 4, but that means it divides 2 times 2. But 1 plus i root 3 does not divide 2. So that means that our condition for being a prime is not true. Look at our condition for being a prime. If p divides a, b, then p divides a or p divides b. Well, here we have p divides a times b, but it doesn't divide well, either of them because they're the same. Okay, so here we've got another example of a ring where we have an irreducible element, but that's not prime. Okay, that's a good place to stop.